everyone. My name is Evangeline, and I serve on the worship team here. Today, we will be reading from Habakkuk 1, verse 12, to Habakkuk 2, verse 1, um, from the English Standard Version. So feel free to follow along either in your physical Bibles or in your Bible app or the screen behind me. Verse 12. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil, it cannot look at wrong. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them, he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. Thank you, brother. Good morning, church. It's great to see all of you, especially if you're new with us. Welcome. I know it takes a little bit of courage to come to a place that you may not know the the normal flow and may not know all the people here. So if you are new, just really glad that you made that step today and are worshiping with us. Um, I have the privilege of pastoring this people. My name is uh, uh, Stephen. And before we get into the message today, uh, I want to pray for what's going on in Israel and Palestine right now. like you all, absolutely uh, horrified by some of the videos and images of lives lost in the way in which they were lost. And our hearts are heavy. Um, You know, Psalm 122, the psalmist says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You know, God has a special place in his heart for Israel. Uh, That's his chosen people. And I believe that there are promises yet to be fulfilled. Um, And he's gonna do that. And at the same time, we can pray for both Palestinians and Jews. We can pray for their safety. We can pray that even through this conflict and the the chaos that's going on in that region right now, that God would use what's happening to draw people to himself and that both Jews and Muslims would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, amen? Amen. So can we pray towards that end this morning? Father, we... We thank you that you are a sovereign God. God, you're not surprised by what is taking place. God, your heart uh, breaks for what is happening, the evil, the loss of lives, families that are mourning right now. And so God, we agree with the psalmist and pray for peace in Jerusalem, that they would be secure who love you. And Lord, that you would comfort families, that you would draw all men to repentance. God, that there would be a a harvest of souls that come to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I was 18 years old and considering what school, college I was going to go to, trying to decide. I had got accepted into George Washington University and was super excited about going there. My dad had gone to medical school there. My grandfather had gone to medical school there. I wanted to do something in political science. And so, I mean, to be at the heart of the nation, its capital, you know, majoring in political science, I mean, it was like, this was gonna be my dream. And so my mom and I, we walked the campus. I fell in love with it, saw all the, the flyers for political organizations and uh, various clubs, and I, I was sold. And the last stop that we made was the financial aid office, which probably in hindsight should have been maybe the first stop. Uh, But I was pleased to learn that because both my father and grandfather went there, um, that I was awarded a legacy scholarship of $1,500 
out of $53,000 a year, which was, you know, then 53, I think now it's even crazier than that. Uh, and let's just say God very purposefully closed the door on that dream in that moment. But I remembered, I mean, it doesn't seem like a big deal now in hindsight, but I remember as an 18-year-old, the confusion around, God, I feel like you're calling me to this school, and yet the door seems closed. Have you ever been unclear with what God is doing? Like utterly confused. You're not doubting necessarily that God is real, that he created the universe, that he sent his son to die for you. You're good on all that stuff, but you don't understand why God seems so unfair in a particular situation that you're going through. What we're looking at today in the book of Habakkuk is really the prophet Habakkuk wrestling with what seems to be unfair. He looks at his nation of Judah and he sees so much violence, so much injustice. This was supposed to be God's people who were faithful to him and yet the leaders had betrayed their worship of God, they turned their back on him, injustice runs rampant in the streets. And so Habakkuk, as a prophet of God, as someone who hears God and speaks on his behalf, is asking God, God, where are you? He's complaining, he's lamenting to God. And you know, sometimes we feel like our prayers have to be very polite and respectful, and we should be uh, in reverence of God. We, show, we should approach him with reverence. But sometimes we got to get real and raw and honest with God. Sometimes we have to let out a complaint. And sometimes just the direction of our complaint, the fact that it's directed towards him and not to somebody else, communicates that although we're frustrated, there's, a, there's an underlying trust. And so here Habakkuk is asking God to do something, to intervene. He asks God, how long is this going to go, this kind of injustice? And then a couple of weeks ago, we talked about where God responds in Habakkuk chapter one. And God says, Habakkuk, you wouldn't believe what I'm going to do if I told you. I'm actually raising up this group called the Chaldeans, another name for the Babylonians. And they are going to be my instrument of justice. They're going to come in swiftly and they're going to take care of business. And all of a sudden, Habakkuk starts backpedaling pretty quickly. God, I'd actually rather have my prayer unanswered than that kind of answer. You ever pray a prayer that when you get the answer, you go, you know what, I kind of liked it better when I didn't have an answer to that prayer. <laughs> That's not what Habakkuk had in mind because the Babylonians were more evil than the injustice that, he, that Habakkuk saw in Judah. And so now Habakkuk's launching into his second complaint. Who would have known you'd show up to church and we'd be talking about complaining today? But it's a good kind of complaint. Habakkuk is, is talking with God. In the midst of this sea of confusion, Habakkuk grabs a hold of some life preservers. And I would just, I would just ask the question this morning, when you go through something, do you have anything that you can hold on to? Do you have anything that'll float that you might be drowning, but at least you got something that can keep you a little bit afloat Amen. until you can get the perspective that you need. Habakkuk begins this passage that we looked at today, in verse 12, listing some attributes of God. He's declaring some things that he knows to be true about God. He says, are you not from everlasting? What Habakkuk is declaring is that God is eternal. Now, if we were to think about eternity in the future sense, it's, it's bigger than our minds can comprehend. You ever just stop and think about how long forever is? But what Habakkuk is speaking to is not only is God forever in the future, God is forever in the past. God has no beginning. I mean, try getting your mind around that. Everything that we know, that we see, that we experience has some kind of beginning. But Habakkuk is saying, God, you are eternal. You came from eternity past. Addresses God as O Lord, O Rock. This is the same Lord that when God revealed himself to Moses, he said, My name is I. He's, he says, in Eng, It would be in English, I am who I am, Yahweh. I am the covenant keeping God. I'm the God who never fails. 
So what Habakkuk is declaring in the midst of his sea of confusion is, God, you are a rock. You are unchanging. You are the covenant-keeping God. You are Yahweh. You are the one who always was, always is, and always will be. He says, my holy one. Now, most of us, if I was to ask us, you know, are you a good person? Most of us would say, well, yeah, we're a pretty good person because we compare ourselves to who? Somebody worse off than us. But God is the only one in a distinct category. He is the only one truly holy. There is no blemish in God. There's no imperfection. There's no evil motivation. There's nothing impure in God. He is completely set apart, consecrated, other than us. He is holy. Habakkuk is grabbing hold of these life preservers. He doesn't understand why God would use the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, this fierce and and violent empire. But he says, God, you have ordained them. You have established them. What Habakkuk is declaring is, God, I may not understand what's going on right now, but what I do know is that nothing happens outside of your control. You are sovereign. You're not surprised by this. You're not, on, you're not backpedaling. This is a part of your plan. And although I may not understand your plan, I know it's a part of your plan. Yeah. He says, you've ordained them for judgment. You've established them for reproof. Habakkuk understood that God is just. That God is not one to just sweep sin underneath the carpet. God deals with sin. And so he was dealing with his people using the Babylonians because God is a just God. Trust me, you want a God who takes sin seriously. You want a God who is going to punish evil. Why? Because all of us long for justice. When we see injustice, we say, that's not right. Someone needs to do something about that. And God is the one who ultimately does something about those situations. God is holy, God is just, God is sovereign, God is faithful. Habakkuk, while he's reeling, is grabbing hold of these life preservers. And you know, we have a number of classes here, life of grace, life of freedom, life in the spirit. They're not just classes for membership. They're classes to establish life preservers in your life. Their class is about who is the Holy Spirit, who is Jesus Christ, and what he secured for you on the cross. The attributes of God are not something that we just give mental assent to. The revelations that change us, that hold us when we're going through something. You see, if your revelation of who God is is based off of your circumstances, what ha- happens when your circumstances change? Yeah. If you know God is good because your bank account looks good, what happens when your bank account looks bad? If you know God is a healer because you're in good health, what happens when you have bad health? No, a revelation is when you know God to be true. What he says he is based on how he's revealed himself in his word. And when you know God through his word, through a revelation, it changes how you experience difficulty. It makes you buoyant. It makes you rise to the surface of the chaos that you're in. What do you do when you experience, when your your experience seems to deny everything you know to be true about who God is? For Habakkuk, this is his for real God moment. You know, everybody's got a for real God kind of moment. I mean, if you haven't had one yet, you're going to have one. Trust me. And when that moment happens, what do you do? Well, Habakkuk, um, he, he, most of us, when we go through something really challenging, our vocabulary gets dumber. When we get cut off in traffic, we, we say things that maybe like a, a child would say, right? Four-letter words, things like that. Habakkuk, when he gets upset, he gets poetic. I'm convinced if Habakkuk was an R&B singer today, he'd be like Beyonce or he'd be like Luther Vandross, better than that. He, I mean, if he was a country singer, he would win a CMA award because this brother gets so poetic in his pain, he brings out Babylon personified. Here's what he's gonna do. He's gonna, he's gonna paint a picture of how much in turmoil he actually is. He uses this word, he says, God, Why are you allowing them to swallow us up? 
And then he moves into this fish, fishing analogy. Now, I've been deep sea fishing once, uh, or multiple times. Uh, the second, third, and fourth time I went deep sea fishing, I was terribly seasick. I won't paint the picture poetically of what that looked like. It was terrible. You say, well, why would you endure such a thing multiple times? Well, my first experience of deep sea fishing was so incredible that I'm chasing to have that experience again. I mean, when, when my dad and myself and, and our family went deep sea fishing in the Gulf of Mexico the first time, we must have caught 100 fish. I mean, every time we, we threw out a line, we caught a fish. I mean, it was just like three hours of nonstop catching fish. And I remember as a, as a 10-year-old pulling these fish in, and you know, they would put up a little bit of a fight, but fish are pretty helpless. There's a reason why we have the expression like you're floundering like a fish, right? Because you reel in this fish, I mean, what kind of animal gets stuck on a hook? I mean, that's kind of lame, right? Then you put the fish in a cooler with ice, and then when you put the next fish in, when you open up the cooler, put the next fish in, you see the first fish, and it's like, I mean, it's, it's a pretty pitiful existence, right? And then you, you bring these fish to the, to the dock, and you have this you know, experienced fisherman start filleting the fish. He's literally chopping off the head, chopping off the tail, filleting the skin, throwing it out to the bird. I mean, fish do not live a very uh, royal existence, right? <laughs> and so what Habakkuk is saying is, God, verse 14, you make mankind like the fish of the sea. Now, you have to recognize how much, how deep this cut. Because for Habakkuk, I mean, he knew what we call our Old Testament. He knew the first five books of the Bible. And in the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis, Genesis 1.28, God gives the creation mandate. He tells Adam and Eve, here's what I want you to do. I want you to rule with me. And you are to have dominion over what? The fish of the sea. Habakkuk says, God... Not only do we have dominion over the fish of the sea, we're actually now the fish getting eaten up. We're the fish that are getting swallowed. And the Babylonians are like gleeful weekend fishermen reeling us in and having a party on a boat. Verse 15, he brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet. He's per personifying Babylon as a fisherman. And he's saying he's using hooks. He's using then those big nets, commercial nets that you throw out into the sea. And in fact, the Babylonians would later on, they would take their cue from the Assyrians, which, were the, which was the empire uh, prior to them, very powerful empire. And what the Babylonians would do is they would take their captors and they would put a literal hook on the bottom of their lip and they would string their captors back to Babylon. They would do that to the, the people of Judah. This was literally fulfilled. In fact, they found ancient uh, reliefs, those things that, you know, images on, on rocks, of the Babylonian gods celebrating while their uh, Judah captors were squirming in the dragnet. So this all came to fruition. And for Habakkuk, what he's struggling with is, God, I know who you are. I know you're a God of justice. I know you're sovereign. I know you're holy. These are life preservers to me, but it feels like my life preservers have holes in them. You're an eternal God, but you're allowing us to die. You're a faithful God, but we're getting caught up in nets like all these other pagan nations around us. You're holy, and yet you're using an evil people to judge us. You're just, but this feels so unjust. You're sovereign, but this situation is spiraling out of control. How long will this last? Verse 17, is he then to keep on emptying his net and merciless, mercilessly killing nations forever? Will this go on forever, God? This wicked nation taking us in their nets like fish? And while Habakkuk is using this analogy for Judah and what he's seeing in his nation, really it describes well what's happening in his own soul. He's caught up in a net of confusion. He's caught up in a net of unmet expectations and accusations against God. And I'd imagine here this morning that 
Maybe there's a few of us there as well. Like, God, are you going to do anything about this marriage that's falling apart? God, this financial pit that I can't seem to dig myself out of, this family drama that seems to have no end, this mental health crisis that no matter how many therapists I see, no matter how many self-care days I take, I just can't get through. I can't get past. What do you do when you're caught up in the net? Do you give up? Do you resign yourself that this is how it's always going to be? Do you get angry with God and maybe lead the faith? Well, this is where Habakkuk switches metaphors. And depending on your version of the Bible, some versions will group chapter 2, verse 1, with what we read here previously at the end of chapter 1. Some kind of create a separate section. But I've lumped it together, what's in the ESV as well, because this is how Habakkuk responds to the sea of confusion that he's in. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. Habakkuk goes, I need to get higher. When you're in a situation when there's a fog, when you can't see clearly, you have to elevate. You have to either wait or your wilt. Now, a watchtower was these fortresses in the ancient times. The watchtower was the highest place, and the watchmen would stay up all night looking out for the clearest and the earliest information available to him. See, when you get up, you get a prophetic picture. Now, that word might be unfamiliar. Pro- prophecy, it's, it's hearing God, and it's speaking on his behalf. Habakkuk, as a prophet, is ascending. He's going up in prayer. See, you think, we think he's just complaining. But as Habakkuk is pouring out his heart to God, he's rising up his faith. He's getting it all out before God, and he's elevating in the spirit. He's getting a higher perspective so that he can see what God is doing. I got to get up because my view down here just isn't working. I appreciate the fact that maybe you had a mama who prays. Maybe you had an aunt who prayed for you. or Maybe you have a YouTube sermon that, or pastor that you really love. Or you have a TikTok, TikTok influencer or Christian influencer. But there comes a point where you need personally a revelation from Jesus Christ. You need to hear God on your own with your Bible in prayer on your watchtower looking for the earliest and the clearest indication of what God might be doing. If you You'll get up higher. You'll see what no one else sees. You're either going to wait or you're going to wilt. You're going to either get up or you're going to get swallowed up. You're going to either fly higher or you're going to get tired. We got to ascend. In those moments of confusion where there's fog, we have to go higher. Now, this week, um, two of my very close friends... We're in South Africa. We had our, our global family of churches. It's called Every Nation. So Grace Covenant Church, we have a couple different congregations in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area. We're part of a network of churches called Every Nation. We had our world conference in South Africa. We do that every three years here last week. And so my, my friends, Pastor A.J., Pastor Tellus, who are pastors in Chantilly, were in South Africa for the conference. And during one of their free moments, they climbed what's called Table Mountain. Now, Table Mountain in Cape Town is, I mean, it's like an amazing uh, view. I mean, trust me, I've seen it on Instagram, okay? I'm an expert. Um, So they're climbing on this mountain, and it's good. There's only one problem. They couldn't see a thing. It was completely foggy. And so here they are living the tourist life, and yet they can't see a very thing. And then this happened. Guys, show the clip. It's terrible audio, by the way. So literally for their two-hour hike, they're climbing and they see nothing. And then as they get to the very top, the fog lifts for 30 seconds or 10 seconds, 
for them to see. I said, brothers, you lived that experience just so I could preach it on Sunday. This goes exactly with my, with my passage. But when you elevate in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the fog, when you pray and you get in your watchtower, all of a sudden the cloud opens. And it might just be for 10 seconds. But the view that you see changes everything. You say, well, Pastor Stephen, look, I don't have time to pray. You know, I, nothing really happens when I pray. I'm really busy. When you get in that watchtower... When you come with us on Sunday night on our Zoom call, we pray as a church, or you get in that morning devotional time, and it's just you and Jesus, and everybody else is asleep, and you just get what you just get, that glimpse. But that one little glimpse changes everything. It changes everything. And that's where we leave Habakkuk's story today. Come back for episode four next Sunday. (laughs) Habakkuk's up in his watchtower He's poured out his complaint to God. At this point, he's got no answer, but he's waiting and he's watching. But for us, we have a little bit of a different vantage point. We have the privilege of looking back on history and knowing what God has done. And this wouldn't be the last time that God would deal with injustice using an evil instrument like he did with the Babylonians at the cross of Christ. Talk about the confusion in that moment. I mean, it's old news for many of us. We've heard the story. But think about for Jesus in that moment, an eternal God, but he allows his son to die. A faithful God who appears to have broken covenant with his own son by letting his son die on a cross. A holy God who hands over his perfect son to an evil people who crucified him. A just God whose son hangs on a cross unjustly. A sovereign God who seemingly has lost all control. But it was on Jesus' watchtower, a towering cross that Jesus was unjustly nailed to. But don't misunderstand because it was on this cross despite being forcefully crucified that Jesus really was surrendering and willfully acting in obedience. With nails pierced through his hands and feet, a crown of thorns in his head, suffocating and excruciating pain as he was lifted up on top of Golgotha, Jesus had a view, a perspective of what God was doing for all of humanity. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That is a watchman on a watchtower. And three days later, lying in that tomb, seemingly caught up in the net of death, Jesus was vindicated when the Spirit of God raised him from the dead. And I would just suggest to you this morning that in the midst of your confusion, in the midst of your doubts, in the midst of your pain, in the midst of what you might feel like is injustice or unfairness from God on your behalf, oh, if you'll trust in the eternal faithful, holy, sovereign, just God, if you'll trust in Jesus' vindication on that cross for you, you'll experience the same vindication that he experienced. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death was defeated on that cross. And that which looked so unjust... Son of God crucified at the hands of an angry mob turned out to be a part of God's perfect plan. And maybe, just maybe, the confusion you're experiencing in God's 10-dimensional chess, in God's sovereignty, he's somehow working it for your good, and he's somehow restoring and making new and renewing, and he's somehow going to use that as a testimony to testify of his resurrection power. If you will get on that watchtower, watch and wait. Last year I sat at George Washington University looking at those same posters that I'd looked at as an 18 year old across a table eating lunch with a student, sharing the gospel with him, going through a Bible study. And I was reminded, oh God, in that moment you weren't calling me to a school, you were calling me to a city. 
And I had to trust you that your plan for my life was better than my plan for my life. I don't know where your story will end pertaining to the specific situation that you might be going through. But if you're caught in a net, are you going to roll over? Are you going to settle for a solution of your own? Or are you going to climb up on that tower once again? It's tower time. Tower time. I want to give you four practical things you could do this week to get in your tower. One, coffee and Habakkuk. I mean, some of you early morning people, you don't get, I mean, grab a cup of coffee, grab the Bible, sit down in a quiet place. For some of you with young kids, maybe with a baby in your lap, and hear from your God what he'd have to say to you. Maybe it's driving on your way to work or going on the metro. You just got music in. You're listening to Victory Boyd or your favorite worship leader, and you're allowing the Spirit of God to speak to you. Maybe it's late at night in your prayer closet. It doesn't matter when as much as it matters that you get up in that tower. Yeah. Or fourthly, maybe it's a different place or a different pace. This morning, God spoke to me. You know where I was? I was in a tent with my eight-year-old son in Greenbelt, Maryland, camping with his trail life troop. And I didn't get a whole lot of sleep, but I was awake to hear from God. And he started speaking to me about things we can do as a church. Different place, a different pace. Maybe it's a one-day retreat or a half-day retreat. Maybe it's getting out of the normal routine so that you can hear from God. But we are a prophetic people. The church is called to be a people that hears from God that elevates and that sees what God is doing even when it feels like he's not doing anything. Amen. Get the perspective you need. And lastly, for some of you uh, here, maybe getting in your watchtower looks like surrendering your life to Jesus today. You've never done that. You can't elevate without the Spirit of God. You can't ascend without first descending and surrender your life to Jesus. So with every head bowed, I want to pray for you this morning, if that's you. You say, Stephen, I need to surrender my life to Jesus for the first time, or maybe, you know what, I've been, I followed God at one point in my life, but my life now doesn't look like what a Christian's ought to look like, and I want to come back home to God. I want to return to Him. If that's you, would you just raise your hand boldly today? Amen. Anyone else? Okay, you raise your hand. Just, just pray this after me. You can pray it quietly. Because God hears your, your prayer. Just say, Father, I'm sorry for the way I've lived. Today I choose to turn from my sin and to accept you, Jesus, into my heart. Come into my life. Change me. I believe you died and that you rose again, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that 